Hello everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Alina Satish and I'm the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Student Ambassador for Careers Network. We're delighted to be welcoming you to this event that is Energy Levels, Relationships and Autism. In conversation with Helen Coy as part of UOB's Disability History Month program. For a full program of events, head over to birmingham.ac.uk slash DHM. A little housekeeping before we get started. For those joining us online, live captions are available and this session is being recorded as well. If you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat as we go along in the Q&A box and Helen will take some time at the end to answer these questions. So let's get started. It's my absolute pleasure to welcome you and our speaker for today, Helen Coy. Thank you for joining us and would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, thank you so much. Yes, hi, hi everyone um, and everyone here and at home. Uh, so yeah, my name's Helen um, and I work at University of Birmingham Sport and Fitness. Um, I've been around at the university for ages, uh, which has been which has been lovely, um, very much a choice. So I did my undergrad here, um, I did my masters, I did two years of a PhD, and then went um, and then um, I've I've worked here ever since in different places. So we're in the law school today, which was also I worked in the law school for a while as well. So uh, yeah, no, lovely. Um, so yeah, I work in UB Sport, and I've been a manager there for the last. Gosh, I think it's seven years, pretty much. Yeah, I think it'd be seven years in January. Okay, thank you, Helen. So first of all, let's cover a bit of background. Can you explain a little bit about your journey to being diagnosed and what it did look like? And how did you come to that realization that you might be autistic? So yeah, my, um, so I'm 34 now. I had my diagnosis, ne again, nearly two years ago. So it would have been, yeah. Uh, two Februarys ago, um, yeah, nearly two years. So my sister is a couple of years younger than me and she had an Asperger's diagnosis and I don't think they actually issue them like that anymore. I think it's just autistic spectrum disorder. Um, but yeah, she, um, it was when my mum and her were like researching my sister's diagnosis. Um, they were kind of like, oh, we never, cause me and my sister are so different. Um, it wasn't something that they'd ever, either of them thought off for me and then they said oh, I'll have a look into it and um, my mum being the excellent lady that she is gave me many books to read not all of which I read um, but then she was very nice and read me excerpts from some of the books because she knew I would never get around to it um, and that was really helpful because I was like oh actually yeah some of this does seem to really fit and then um, I had a a really good diagnosis process which like might we might come on to later um or anyone can ask me anything about um but that was um that was all done online um it was during the pandemic but actually i found that really i found that really helpful i wouldn't have minded doing it in person but they were long mm -hmm. like some i think i had three sessions um and one of them was like three hours so i was really pleased that i could be sat on the sofa with my dog and with a cup of tea while i was doing it so um, but yeah, so the process itself is great. And um, yeah, like I say, happy to go into any more detail, but that's the short version. Thank you. So we also wanted to spend some time in today's session focusing on energy levels and relationships. So a lot of autistic people report higher levels of fatigue and exhaustion compared to non-autistic people. If you're familiar with the spoon theory, you're here to you hear a lot in the autistic community that they don't have um, the available spoons, meaning the energy levels to undertake certain tasks, whether it is socializing or running an errand or whatever. They often find that they don't have the energy resource resources available in them. So why do you think that happens? Uh, yeah, brilliant example. Um, and I try not to get too carried away on, yeah. on this uh, on this topic. Um, one of my friends, Jess, who used to work for Autism West Midland, she told me about the spoon story. Like I think probably in like my mid twenties, so back before I even looked into a diagnosis myself. So I've used it. I probably was using it as like a mechanism, either in my own brain or to signpost like to friends or at work, even before I had my diagnosis. And I think. I was aware of it because I I've had I think I had my depression diagnosis in like probably around the time at the same time with the PhD <laughs> um, <laughs> correlation I don't know anyway um, <laughs> um, so I was aware of like kind of the things I was struggling like depression or anxiety wise first and I kind of was aware that some days were worse than others um, I would notice uh, sort of the spoon thing and then I'd say the biggest thing now and I'll, I'll 
come back to you know why I think that is with um because obviously not every autistic person is the same just in the same way that every other human being isn't the same as each other um so I can obviously talk about my experience um but it's been really interesting the last couple of years trying to unpack um how because I still um I would I still take medication for depression, even though I wouldn't necessarily like, I would say I'm on a pretty even kill. I mean, my lovely friend and colleague Sophie's here today, I mean, who gets to hear pretty much how I'm feeling every single day. And um, like, I will update like all my colleagues every day and say like, um, if it's a particularly tired day, um, energy levels wise, I'll let them know if I'm like, um, I would say, you know, you you know, the question is like, why do you think that happens? And um, for me anyway, it's like, it's almost just like, I I don't overthink, not everything, but a lot of things. So even just silly things like um, what I'm wearing in the morning, and it's not like I'm, oh my God, I must look perfect. It's not that I'm weirdly OCD about, um, I have to have matching socks. I have to have, it's not even like I mind clashing colors, but in my head, the things that I'm wearing have to, and they have to match my mood. And, and also I'm really messy, <laughs> really messy. So like, I often can't find things in my own house, which drives me mad. But then you go through the whole, oh, I'm annoyed at myself. Why is this taking me so long to even leave the house in the first place? Um, other people can leave faster than me. Grr. Then, so I think the big thing with the autism diagnosis, it's made me less mad at myself so that actually probably in a way gives me back some of my energy sometimes because i don't do as much introspection yeah. i kind of go this is a thing i am not good at and then i can just park it and go you know yeah. so that really helps so um some day and it really is that some days are better than others some days i wake up and i genuinely i'm like oh, i'm having a 12 spoon day out of 10 you know <laughs> say and then I, I will say to my like lovely team and I'll go, guys, if you've got any complicated problems, now's the time. Or if you've got any like, um, you know, anything particularly people I'll try and, you know, uh, do as many of those things when I've got the energy as I can. Um, and then I think the final thing in answer to that sort of specific question, why do you think that is? For me, it's taken a long time to go, what takes most of your energy so even though i love people i love them i think i'm actually an extroverted introvert in and what i think like being basically being on my own is what gives me my energy back or being with my dog or with my partner like we just and i'm not trying to work out what someone wants or needs and like and i think because i care so much about getting it right and I don't think I realized for a long time how hard I was working to understand all the interactions. So um, that's kind of the thing that one of the reasons for me anyway is like, I suppose, a bit of an emotional overload. Um, there's sensory stuff as well, but I'm sure we can come on to that. That's the main thing for me that probably is an energy drainer, if you like. Got it. Great. Thank you. And the audience online, please don't uh, forget to put any questions that you uh, would like um, to be answered on the Q&A box. And Helen, in terms of your experience, what were your key challenges when it came to energy levels? Maybe? Um, yeah, definitely. I think um, by manager job, I love it. One of the big things I find difficult is um, every uh, every monday for example we've got like a heads of department meeting um they're great colleagues that's not the thing it's but the i think the more people who are in the room the longer where i'm trying to like navigate what they really mean as well so i'm i'm relatively straightforward um i'm obviously there's a certain amount of trying to make sure that i'm not like getting and saying stuff wrong so i'm not saying I, i'm not saying i don't filter anything i do but like I'm quite often going, I want to do as well as I can, because I'm naturally a nerd. So you want to do as well as you can in all the situations. But then I'm also going, but is this going to tread on other people's toes? Maybe they need, I shouldn't speak first, they need more time. So it's, I say there's a lot of learned experience that goes into that. So challenges wise, um, making sure, and I'm sure, you know, we'll come on to like coping mechanisms and stuff, but 
Um, definitely a challenge is like making sure I don't have too many things either in my day or in my week. Uh, in my 20s, I was awful for stapling plans back to back to back. And uh, particularly because of the depression, I didn't want to be on my own because then I was stuck with my own thoughts. So I would say it was almost like then the depression probably exacerbated like, you know, the autism sort of overdrive, any sort of burnout or melt, meltdown sort of stuff because I wasn't giving myself the space I needed. So, um, yeah, I'd say one of the biggest challenges, <laughs> my own natural inclination to say yes to everything, um, but that's definitely like I've got a much stronger control over that now I, f I feel anyway um also I just like being at home and going to bed really early <laughs> hanging out with my dog so naturally that helps yeah I completely get that <laughs> and thank you for that and a lot of autistic people describe the experience as burnout mm -hmm. so do you have any strategies that you would say that you use or try to manage to avoid these burnouts yeah so like I've kind of touched touched on a couple. I mean, my biggest one, like there's the self-management and I'll, I'll come back to that, but I'd say my biggest one that I use it, I signpost hard to people. And that's, it's the way I match because I think, uh, again, lots of different types of the way autism manifests itself. I am quite over empathetic rather than under so because of that i like um i'm like all the time i'm trying to pick up on all the little signs where like um what could make someone be happier it's like my my goal um so for me i've like you take in all that information um so then particularly like for my team if i'm having a low spoons day it's really important that I tell them, right, like I signpost and say, or like with my partner, like sometimes I'll get in the car at the end of the day and be like, I've genuinely said to her, Fiona, I can listen to the information. I am not capable of responding and sounding like I care, but I do care. Does that make sense? So it's like, I would love to listen to it. Yeah. And I think like, it's really, I'm really lucky to have such great people in my life that can understand that. So like, you know, say with like sometimes in the team, I can be like, give me stuff through message or through email, but I can't manage a conversation because I know even with like, even with colleagues, I know that I'll try and I'll still want to do all the levels of correct social interaction. Mm -hmm. I'll still want to mask and support them. So it's almost like I know it will drain me to do it. So I would say signposting right off the bat so that then anything then that comes into me is in a format that I can manage and won't take away too much more energy. Um, and yeah, like I said, um, noticing, not putting in too much stuff before I reach burnout level. Uh, and that's, I mean, it's still a work in progress. I'm, I'm loads better, but I, it, it was like, what would happen before is I would put in too much stuff. And it, when the burnout like happened, whatever, a, plan I'd got to that would just have to go there was no choice anymore my body or my brain or whatever would choose for me so now it's like I go Helen you will not you feel great now I'm useless at thinking I'll feel a different way like even though I know inexperience tells me so I'll go Helen you must if you cut out this thing you like less you will be able to do that thing that really means a lot so again not perfect but no, I get it. Thank you. And uh, what does burnout look like for you? How does it impact you? And do you have like burnout recovery tips maybe? Yeah, I know. Again, great. And it's really helpful me like reminding myself of these things, especially coming up for Christmas. Um, so I get migraines uh, a lot um, and uh, trying to work out, yeah, how to avoid them, uh, but also how to deal with them. So my migraines because i get so i mean so the purple glasses are linked to kind of um I'm, can be quite sensitive to light um and I pretty much just end up having to lie in the dark with and, and again like i say it's more like my body brain whatever ends up choosing for me mm -hmm. so um if i'm quite lucky i can sometimes get to more like a a burnout stage where 
it's more like I say I might be able to come to work but like or I might be able to work from home mm -hmm. but just like I might have to chop all my meetings um and my like my manager is really supportive but it is interesting like the perception in the working world that it's like you're either fit for work or you should be calling in sick and there's I have a quite an interesting gray area where oh I can absolutely do some work and I can crack through some problems but I can do things one at a time and I can't deal with any of the emotional impact of things so it's almost like there were tasks that I would take out of that day and put into another one but it doesn't mean I need a day off yeah so um yeah that's that's interesting and that's probably like something that I still have further to go but then maybe that's less me and that's more like it's a difficult thing I think for any institution or company to try and like how do you I mean it's been interesting since COVID though because lots more people have the flexibility to work from home so that's a nice thing yeah with the hybrid situation yeah um and what advice would you give to someone to support um to their autistic burnout or whether it's a friend a lecturer a family member it's really difficult because yeah you don't want to be preachy um and I'm not exactly, you know, perfect at anything. Um, I think when the burnout comes, like, don't try and don't try and fight it. Or if you've got like, so sometimes, sorry, I keep pointing at Sophie, my <laughs> colleague. Um, if I sometimes she'll get like, let's say on Monday, so when I got a migraine and I knew I wasn't going to be able to do anything, and I knew I had a really limited like bit where I was both going to be able to look at my screen, mm -hmm. um, and my brain was going to function enough to be coherent, to pass over all the stuff that was in my head. Mm -hmm. So you just got like this WhatsApp message, didn't you? That just went, this needs to happen, this needs, to... and it wasn't just to Sophie, it was to my whole team, but it was like, at Sophie this, Kate this, invite Casper to this meeting, but, 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 and I just, but again, I've got colleagues that are really excellent and probably don't need me to be that, like, they probably would have done it all on their own, but for my brain, I've gone vroomph. So I think, that's i would suggest people having mechanisms in place either with partners friends colleagues so that if a burnout does happen it doesn't add to the burnout that you're then going oh my god i can't stop because all of this stuff is so important because you know we're conscientious hard-working humans you want to complete everything that you've said that you're going to so having i mean people just knowing that i'm autistic i find very helpful i find telling people helpful it makes me feel less i don't know less stupid that i can't do the things uh sometimes um i don't know if that's the right word but it makes it and, and i feel but i also feel like it gives other people a good frame of reference like they go instead of going oh why is why didn't this person just sleep more they go oh okay this person is saying it's something that they can't do so I would say, yeah, biggest thing for other people would be if you haven't had conversations and prepped people, do that when you feel really great because you won't think that you'll need to because you'll be like me and go like, oh, I'll be fine. And then, but if you've had those conversations already, it then makes it much easier when you need to shut down. Yes, thank you for that. And this uh, leads us nearly to the other area we wanted to talk about, that is relationships. So autistic people report higher levels of social isolation, bullying, and so on. For a long time, it was believed that autistic people struggle with social communication. But more recently, research suggests that communication difficulties arise between autistic and non-autistic people, and, and actually a result of what's known as double empathy problem, suggesting that difficulty arises on both sides and not just on the side of the autistic person. So this theory suggests that autistic people socialize in a different way um, to others and they, their way of socializing is not a deficit, just a different way of interacting maybe. And could you give any examples or maybe difficulties that you've maybe faced in relationships? It's so great because even as you're saying it, I just thought of things that I hadn't even thought of earlier. Like, I do have excellent funny stories. So, um, and some great examples. So, I'll, st I'll start off by saying I do have to tell people that I'm useless at banter. <laughs> so, like, uh, because I can be quite literal. It's not all the time. Again, it depends on how many spoons I have. So, it's so good we talked about the spoons thing earlier because, yeah. <laughs> Like, we'll know if it's a good day, won't we? If I'm like, I made a joke, or I understood banter, and it's funny. 
Um, but yeah, I would say, I would say growing up, um, like that kind of insulty type, jokey thing, I, I can do banter with somebody, but I have to know them really well. And I have to know that like, there's like mutual and reciprocal love. Yeah. And that, that I, because then I'm not second guessing the nature of our relationship. So like, so my best friends from school, like some of my, co- like, I, t- I mean, quite often I try and banter with people just to accidentally insult them. But luckily, <laughs> this is why it has to be, we have to be friends, because otherwise I'm just going to lose them. Um, <laughs> Oh no, there's, again, there's too many funny examples to come back to. I can tell you that at the end if you want more funny examples of me misfiring hard. Um, but yeah, I would say most of the time then I find it, I spend too much time then going like, what do they really want or need from me? And then I've missed it. And so my, you know, you say can be, you know, autistic people can interact differently. Um, I, I'd, I'd, I'd say I'm a pretty good masker, like, a, you know, no one but I didn't realize I was doing it. I just am watching all the time to figure out the right way to interact with different groups, which is what all humans do anyway, you know, is change their interaction style depending on the group they're with. Um, I'd say I naturally suit uh, friendship styles where you do more like story exchange, funny story exchanges, like one person talks, people laugh at the hilarious story. Someone else shares a a similar story. That's, probably like where I fit best because mm-hmm. like I'm listening to one thing I'm enjoying that thing and then I understand whose turn it is to speak and like so it's almost like I suppose that suits me it's, it's not necessarily the same for everybody um and I you know and I wanted to look at like relationships because there's obviously so many different kinds whether they be like romantic or friendship um or, again I've been really lucky I have succeeded at having both relationships and friendships, I hope. I mean, Sophie might be here under duress, but um, <laughs> but um, uh, I mean, again, I currently have a partner. Again, she hasn't left me yet, so um, I I I feel lucky with the people that I do have, and I, I overall my my story is a very lucky one. Um, I mean, I'm sure there was some stuff in school. I mean, I definitely got called weird a lot at school, but I think it was relatively affectionate like I I was lucky I was lucky my school wasn't my favorite but for lots of reasons I didn't like uniform I didn't understand a lot of the rules I thought they were stupid um but yeah <laughs> um but yeah and I think there was so much in that question I don't even know if I've even touched on all of it but yeah I don't know if there were I think you mostly yeah. covered it was about relationships and you know how oh, your yeah, difficulties. difficulties as well yeah. um I think when people uh, my biggest thing is when people aren't straightforward so and i don't that's not a criticism it's the way people work so i will illustrate it with a great story from our lovely friend becky who uh in the office said something like she wanted her her um her boyfriend to she'd said oh no i don't want this or like she said no no don't get me don't get me any biscuits and he was supposed to know that that meant she did want biscuits and i was like but how how that's not how you've used your words she was like but he but he should know and i'm like but how (laughs) so i would say in relationships i need to be able to trust that what and now that i know again know myself much better i need to be able to trust that what someone says is what they mean yeah so probably in the past i've struggled more where if people people say one thing and mean another i know that happens but I'm working so hard the rest of the time, you know, at work and in friendships to try and navigate that. The person who I hopefully live with, spend my like downtime with, if I'm also trying to second guess that, like we're just onto a non-starter um, and my like lovely ex-girlfriend, who's still my friend, like we laugh now looking at like how we ever even tried, but it would be a thing. She'd do really nice things for me, but because she hadn't pointed out that she'd done a nice thing for me, I just thought she was doing something that suited her. And then she felt not thanked. And not, I tell Fiona how great, like I've learned, I've learned experience. I tell Fiona that she's the best thing ever every single day, just in case she's not clear. Yeah. So I don't want to make that mistake again. So I learn, yeah. but um, yeah, I think my biggest thing is like missing what would probably be obvious sometimes to other people as well. I need them to, I need them to, I need them to do a nice thing. I need them to tell me they've done a nice thing. Okay. 
<laughs> and um, what kind of impact do you think um, these kind of experiences like have on you? That's a great question. Um, I mean, such a short question. Um, I suppose, I suppose in the same way that everyone learns through all the relationships they've ever had. Like, again, whether they're romantic or otherwise, you learn something from everything, even the ones that are awful, um, you know, and you know, like I saw some of my best friends the weekend and, you know, there was a long relationship that dragged on in my 20s. I couldn't really let go, but he couldn't really let go either. And I think, I would, like, I wouldn't change it because I just, I just learned a lot more about myself. So it's probably the same neurodivergent, neurotypical, everything that happens helps set you up for where you go going forward. So yeah, yeah I'd, I'd say impact wise, nothing, impact wise, weirdly nothing but positive, That's I good. suppose. Yeah. And uh, what would you say to another autistic person who may be having difficulties in their social relationships? Um, I mean, I'm boring. I'm just going to say signpost again, as in like I'm repetitive. Um, okay, I'm not okay. boring. I'm great fun. Um, <laughs> um, say, say what you need and don't be afraid to say what you need. And that's probably going back to the other question, like what impact has it had on you? Is probably I've learned what I do want as well. And I think that the younger you are, that's the hardest thing to actually even know in the first place. If you don't know what you want or what you're looking for, either from another person or from a relationship, or you know, no one knows what they want from life. Don't worry about that. That's too big a question. Um, <laughs> but like more like how, even how you want other people to interact with you. Like I quite ask, like to try and ask anyway. I'm not sure I succeed all the time, but I like to ask the people I manage and work with how they like to be interacted with or how they like to be managed. And quite a lot of people are kind of like, I don't know. Uh, let's try something and we'll see because most people, but I've learned that because I need to tell people, it's only fair that I would also give that option to yeah. someone else. So um, I would say to other people, try and figure out what's most important to you all, even if it's not the other way around, even if you haven't figured out what you do want, figure out at least what you don't want or figure out what stresses you out. Because then if, at least if you can tell somebody you're really great but this thing that you this pattern of communication i find challenging could you but always give them um always give them a way to change it you don't just like say this would work um this would work better and try and help them with that and then also then also if they're like nah you're wrong um or i ain't gonna do that then you know that it's time for them to go so that also is helpful so yeah. that there we go. See, look at me dispensing <laughs> advice. So, what would you like a non-autistic people to be aware of if they don't um, inadvertently outgroup an autistic person? It's probably. I was thinking about this one beforehand. I think it's just stuff that I would want of all people, regardless. It's um, people react very quickly to like information that they want to know. Mm -hmm. And probably because I'm over the I'm the over empathizing side, I do a what would I want to be asked? Would I want like sometimes you know? So I, I injured my leg recently, so I'm limping about uh, and had a crutches and a cast and everything. And people fascinating taxi drivers who I love taking me home. Thank you. Would not get around without you. But people just think they they just go, oh, how did you do it? I'm like we've known each other for five seconds. And I think what I would probably just ask of all people is people don't give enough other people like, I hate direct questions. So this is very personal, I suppose, really. But I always think conversation should be more malleable. So almost like for me, a way to include me is always to ask a question that's much more open. Like mm -hmm. that person can take it any way that they want. If I'm tired, I prefer to people to just either talk about themselves or talk about something else. Or ask about my dog. Always want to talk about George. Um, so it, it is an interesting one. 
Repeat to me one more time in case I have anything else useful to say. Um, Hopefully. Yeah, so... <laughs> I know, I'm so sorry, jumping no, 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 back, because it was a fine. great point. It was, uh, what would you like non-autistic mm. people to be aware of so they don't inadvertently outgroup an autistic person? Everyone's different, I guess, don't make assumptions. And yeah, I'd stick with being open. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would. I, I can't think of a situation that wouldn't work. And I always think with questions like this, I always try and think about like my sister, who, like I say, is autistic in a very different way to me. And what would make what would put her at ease, make her comfortable um, and anyone else I've ever met. You can only give it a bash. And if you do it with kindness and don't be offended if someone like doesn't take it the right way, as long as you're you've taken a second to think about it and gone, would I actually enjoy being asked this particular specific question in front of a group of others and if you wouldn't think of a different way to put it yeah that makes sense thank you and just one more thing before we move to the q a do you have any key tips in general or for navigating any neurotypical world or what really helps you i mean happily i feel like i've covered it a lot so i won't make yeah. you uh, listen to all of my tips again but um if anyone does have any questions about anything specific or if there's anything that i've touched on like because i've done particularly whether it was academic like i might have left the academic world behind me but there were definitely things that i had to put in place to even get through the two years of the phd that i did mm -hmm. um and um i know we've talked a lot about the working world um, but different kinds of job as well so um the university is a great place to work in terms of flexibility and support um if you worked in a more corporate job where there was a lot more performative yeah. stuff like i knew back in my early 20s i did six months in a recruitment agency it was lovely but i knew i i didn't belong in that performative world is the best way i can describe it so no other specific tips um but i probably would have specific things if there were specific questions Thank you so much. So it's time for Q&A. So do we have any questions from the room? Yeah, it's really interesting. I am lucky. Um, I probably because I tell them and then I uh, very, I probably very quickly also assert myself and I, I, I am assertive <laughs> probably, of all, you know, so I know what I am, I know what my flaws are, but I also know that I'm good at stuff. So I suppose one of the ways that you could address it, depending on like how you're telling people is it's like I'm autistic and this might be how I would need support at the thing. But I think so much of it is with your own tone and the way that you bring it up. And it's it's a tough one, like you say, and I think if you bring it up and there's a way to own it, but, but I'm not saying that I have that every single day either. But I'm not saying that that's easy. Um, like I say, people might have thought that. I, I We've had a couple of new colleagues and like, even though I know I want to tell them, um, I think I st struggle more with a maybe like imposter syndrome where I feel like I'm telling people, is this even relevant? Do, now am I t wasting their time talking to them about it? Like. And I, but don't get me wrong, I do get a bit of, are they going to treat me differently or think I'm less good yeah. at my job? Like, I don't, get, like, I do get that. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm lucky because in sport, people are quite, I say we're pretty good at being inclusive, like, and actually people, I think, I think sometimes when it is in our heads, yeah. that probably does then it probably does affect the way that we then present that information. So um, I would almost think if you if you know you're going to talk about it, think about how you want to do it beforehand. Think about whether you would prefer to talk about it in writing, whether you prefer to talk about it like in person. Um, like so like this talk. So I did a similar talk last year and I clearly was feeling very like, yeah, I'm ready to like and I am always ready to share. But like for some reason this year, I've known about this for like months. Me and Pete said we were going to organize this. And it was only like in the office, I was like, I will just tell people that this is happening. And it's approximately two hours away. And um, yeah, go on. I was going to say that you initially shared yours quite casually at the end of an email, didn't you, to everyone? Um, yes. And that was, 
Uh, yeah. It's such a casual way of doing it, and you think you can't find that nice feedback from people within the youth sport generally. Um, yeah no that is really helpful because i I've, I've yeah forgotten whether or not i shared with a group of people so yeah i, I must have told everyone initially in our department and then because i must yeah i must have done some sort of it's my introduction email is that what it was <laughs> just made it all about me sophie <laughs> sorry <laughs> sorry um i know that's but that's really interesting so then it's like each new person that comes i'll then either yeah tell them about it and it's it's not like it doesn't weigh on my mind about how to bring it up though or like and i do again I just, i'm always judging it by each but I, yeah i do all i would say sorry if you think people are then a bit i i i like to smash people by being really really excellent and well performing i think that's probably the best way of doing it yeah i'm like this is the thing that here's some stuff that i'm not good at as a result but here are all the things that I am great. So then by being super competent, they'll just have nowhere to go because you're excellent. <laughs> what do you think needs to happen in a higher education environment to better support um, staff or students who may be autistic? That's a great question. I, I suppose, actually, if we hadn't had the chat, I would probably be like, oh, but we kind of touched on it. I think there's something around the understanding of you might be well enough to do lots of your job, but you might have days where you can't do it all. And um, I mean, I know sick leave is like a really difficult thing anyway. And for a while I sat on, um, there's a there's a wellbeing advisory group um, and a, it, it was an offshoot of basically the university's like health and safety group. And every meeting we would talk through like the sickness statistics and there was a whole big long going project um, uh, with Philip Gray uh, looking at like basically work related stress and obviously the impact it was having on staff and going off on long term sex. So it was all kind of related. I mean, we were just looking at it from the stats perspective um, and other people were like on the actual like working trying to how do we address this? And I do think if things weren't as aggressively black and white, you're either sick or you're in. Again, we touched on the fact that there's hybrid working, but like us in sport, we don't really have, we deliver, we, you know, we deliver physical programs. So we, it would be very hard for us to have a day. However, um, like say, say with mine, Sophie and Kate's team, um, sort of like it was on Monday, I went here, are all the things that need to happen. Um, and yeah, I, was, I couldn't work at all, but there has definitely been days where I would go, there's definitely been days where I've gone, I have phoned in sick, but done work, if that makes sense. And there's other days where I've, I mean, you guys know, I do weird things sometimes where I use my annual leave, but I'll do work. And that's, that sounds weird. I don't, it's almost because it was, it's easier for me to do that than go, I need to be able to do this part of my job and not, but not these things. And it's a lot to try and explain to somebody like I can work through these problems one by one quietly in email form but I can't do any of these meetings these need to be postponed and sometimes it's just too much if you're already not if you're low on spoons um to describe that to somebody so I think maybe having some some sort of scale or just some sort of like I know there's like been talk of like mental health days and it's it, I mean obviously that's, in, that's so important as well but it's not it's almost not even that it's almost like like a gray day you know if, if if black is off and white is on you're at work you almost need a gray day where you're like I am at work I'm doing as much as I physically can but here are the things I'm moving out of it I suppose that's a very long answer sorry <laughs> thank you it's, yeah um what pushed you to think that maybe you might be autistic uh, I mean, definitely my mum and my sister. I don't think I'd have, <laughs> I don't think I'd have got there. Um, I'm also, um, I don't know what the word is. Uh, I need shoving to do life admin anyway. Like stuff that as soon as there's paperwork or technology involved, I'm disinclined to engage with it. So, <laughs> you know, I'm still paying for some sort of 
beer order they keep sending me beer i just need to phone them and tell them i don't want their beer they keep charging me anyway um because i hate technology but anyway uh so i would say if they hadn't pushed me um but then i went to the gp and luckily then they took over the admin part of the process and then it happened i mean there was definitely a bit where i'd received a letter and i hadn't looked at it and i probably nearly missed my first appointment that kind of stuff but um yeah they were the ones that um and and i would say um i was very on board very quickly because i was like oh good an explanation as to why i'm like the tight you know we go back to the energy levels why it gets so tired so i think i was just relieved that there might be an explanation um for why i couldn't do some stuff so i was pretty pretty pleased yeah <laughs> thank you for that um do we have any other questions yeah so pleased oh, i was terrified that it was going to come back no you're not you're just useless and stuff so i was like i was genuinely relieved i remember i was walking george and i like got the call and they were like yeah no it is you, you know it's an affirmative diagnosis and I was like oh thank god um because I think in my brain I'd already started to like acclimatize anyway but then I didn't want to go I didn't want to start telling people because I'm like what if what if they're like no you're super neurotypical I'd be like well no I don't know how to explain any of this then so <laughs> really that yes that yes um so that i will tell the story just because it is sort of directly relevant so i um probably like lots of us in this room are um a perfectionist and um the thing i and i you know a classic autism thing is you get very into a certain thing and they just love that so i was very into uh, les mills who are a exercise provider and i'm a fitness instructor alongside my normal job and coming out of the phd um doing exercise was a thing i'd like channeled all my all my like positive energy into because like the phd was giving me it was just <laughs> so i was like i need to do something where i'm being positive each day or like i'm achieving something i'm jumping yes this will do um anyway i got good i would like to say quite good at being an instructor and um got put forward for like um like a boot camp and it's a stupid word, it may as well be an audition to be on the presenter team. And being the high achiever that I am, I'm like, excellent, this is great. I'm on the path I'm meant to be. This is fantastic. And it was basically my personality that stopped me from being on the team. And they basically said as much. And some of the feedback was like, Helen, you don't have to be so nice to it. Or you don't have to be as nice to everybody. Or you don't have to try so hard to get people to like you. They'll like you anyway. And um even though i'm really glad i didn't get on the team for many like genuinely for many reasons like um i wouldn't have been able to fit in all the stuff we come back to all the autism stuff that i know about myself now there's no way i would have been able to do everything so something would have had to go or i'd have had some sort of meltdown um lots of lots of good reasons to not do it but i still haven't and i was thinking this literally last night i have still not gotten over the fact that someone rejected me because my personality wasn't right for a thing and that is probably my main thing where i wish i could go back in time and know everything about myself now because i think i think i just completely failed to do any of my masking because i was so in love with this thing and i thought i was in a room of people who also loved this thing so i didn't think i had to pretend to be cool i thought we all loved it so i didn't think i had to pretend i i didn't realize i was auditioning to also be like some sort of instagram poster girl for their company <laughs> i thought i jumped high enough and i i didn't look terrible in their fancy reebok clothes what more did they want from me um apparently they also wanted me to be aloof and cool uh, which let's be honest is not something i'm ever going to manage so again this is fine but yes i do I have regrets of like, you know, I look back and I go, I knowing what I do now, I could go back in time. I'd love to go back in time, smash it and be like, don't want your job anyway. Boom. <laughs> um, <laughs> which is literally what I do. But I, I'm like, why do I care about that validation? Why do I care about that still? Why does that matter? Because they don't, they don't matter to me anymore. I know. Yeah. You know, so not again, I don't know if that's any comfort at all, but yeah, there's not, even though I had a, smoother ride it's not like there's not things where i wish you know 
Thank you for that. Um, are we having any questions online? Um, we good? do have one really good question, mm. which is, what is your favourite thing about being autistic? Ah, that's nice. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, we've touched on it a fair bit. And like you, you said as well, this is like the best bit about the now as well. It's like uh, just not needing to be uh, annoyed at myself or stressed at myself. Like I'm not saying I don't still get like Helen, how have you dropped another cup of tea on yourself? Um, or like, why have you overfilled it again? Why can't you see that that is too close to, I don't know. But I think I find more things, uh, yeah, I don't beat myself up over it. So I, I would genuinely say that's my favorite thing. Okay, great, thank you. Um, are we good? Great, so, well, that's all for today. Thanks to everyone for joining us. Um, as mentioned, a recording of this session will be available afterwards and hopefully in the next week or so. And thanks especially to Helen for such a great time um, to come and share her experience. I think everyone included in this room, I learned something today as well. Aww. And um, give me a new perspective, so thank yeah. you. Thank you so much for hosting you, brilliant. Thank you. Thank, thank you, thank everyone. You. Ah, oh. yay. Oh.